Thank you. Thank you for allowing us in the uh, quick recess there to be able to come and vote. Mr. Gordon, we are going to make your time after all, and I appreciate that. I would like to be able to yield five minutes to Mr. Murphy. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I thank uh, witnesses for uh, coming back um, to join us for uh, just another brief uh, few questions. Um, let, let me just begin by associating myself with the remarks of uh, Ranking Member Conley on the subcommittee, Ranking Member Cummings. Um, you know, let's not get it. I get that this committee has often been used over the years to advance uh, the majority party's uh, political purposes and their agenda. Um, I think we have gone too far uh, here. Uh, I think in violating House rules and violating basic concepts of fairness, um, we have crossed a line. Um, and I think what you have seen across the country is uh, an unfortunate willingness on behalf of those who would try to use their newfound political power to, uh, to try to um, undermine organized labor and collecting bargaining rights to, uh, unfortunately, um, cross that line over and over again, whether it is in uh, Wisconsin with a collective bargaining law that was ruled unconstitutional by the courts or here uh, today. Um, and I hope in the future that, though this committee is certainly going to be used occasionally to advance the political imperatives of the majority party, that the other side gets a chance uh, to put uh, their best evidence on. And so uh, in that would, regard, would, would the gentleman yield? I would yield. Uh, if we are able to provide for the record uh, moments in the past when this committee only had administration witnesses when the roles were reversed and the Republicans were in the minority and uh, were only allowed administration officials under the Bush administration, would that be acceptable? If you would like to put that on the record? We, we will submit that for the record in the days to come. Thank you. Uh, let me, uh, let me uh, direct a question to, uh, to, to Mr. Gordon. Um, Mr. Gordon, uh, in October of last year, um, myself uh, and uh, dozens of other members of Congress sent uh, a letter to you um, requesting information on the executive order that we are talking uh, about today. Um, in particular, uh, we were interested in some direction that you had sent to agencies to report back uh, on uh, uh, how the executive order had been complied with, uh, how many agencies had used PLAs, and to do so on a quarterly basis. Um, uh, we sent this letter over in October and have not gotten a response uh, since, but I would be interested to know from you uh, as to the feedback and response you have gotten from agencies um, in uh, now the year or so since the executive order and then the guidance requiring quarterly reports back uh, was issued. Congressman Murphy, thank you for the question. I apologize that you haven't yet gotten a response. My understanding is the response is, uh, is close to being on its way to you. Um, I, I will tell you that, for the most part, um, we have seen few instances of PLAs being used in construction projects. That is consistent with our guidance. What we have said to agencies is you need to do this carefully. You need to be sure that the use of PL, a PLA in a particular project in those specific facts will serve economy and efficiency. Uh, it is not unusual in the procurement system, as I am sure you know, that when we have a new tool available, and this is essentially a new tool for our contracting officer, it takes a while for us to figure out where it makes the most sense, how to use it. I think that a cautious, balanced approach makes sense. Uh, the fact is that there, there are lots of academic studies out there. Some indicate that PLAs save you money. Some indicate that you don't. Part of the beauty of what GSA has done is you have real examples, not academic studies, of what's actually happened. And I think that's helpful. Uh, have you received uh, reports back? You asked for data on a quarterly basis. Are you receiving that information back? We are. We are, we are and th th as I said, the numbers of, of uh, PLAs being used is quite low. All right. Uh, I would appreciate that uh, response as quickly as possible. This was a group of Republicans and Democrats to show that there is uh, b bipartisan support for the use of PLAs when appropriate, and I think it would be useful for us to have that data shared back. I will ensure that that comes to you expeditiously. L let me ask uh, one uh, other question to both of you. I, I think one of the points that will be made likely by the second uh, panel um, is that uh, nonunion contractors are discriminated against when a PLA is required. 
required that uh, though they can go out and sign a collective bargaining uh, agreement after uh, they are assigned the award, that that puts them in a disadvantage versus contractors who are initially union contractors. Can you uh, talk about that critique? Um, again, we won't have the opportunity to ask this of any uh, minority witness on the second panel, and I imagine it will be one of the primary um, criticisms uh, on the second panel, and so I'd pose it to, to both of you as to whether or not you have seen um, a, a discriminatory nature against uh, non-union contractors when PLAs have been used. I could say a few words, and then Ms. British welcome us to supplement them. Um, as you know, the, the Federal Acquisition Regulation rules says that this is not to be used in a discriminatory, a discriminatory fashion. We are trying to increase competition. Um, I am confident that we can do this in a way that will not discriminate. The fact is that even when project labor agreements are used, very often the subcontractors, for example, are open shops and are not unionized in the, in the workforces. Uh, as we noted in, in the uh, preamble to the Federal Register notice in the rule. But in any event, if a company, if a company feels that an agency is conducting a competition in a way that excludes them and makes it impossible for them to compete, they have an avenue available. They can file a bid protest and they will get an independent review, whether by the Court of Federal Claims or GAO, to consider whether, in fact, they are being excluded or unfairly discriminated against in that competition. Mr. Murphy, in the preliminary data that we have, we have not found that uh, there has been, been any discrimination between union and non-union workers, no, and that is based on our just preliminary, these 10 projects that we have, a handful of projects that we are looking at. But the preliminary indications are that it is not there. Uh, thank you. You have five minutes, Mr. Labrador. I yield back. My time. Thanks, Mr. Labrador. Let, let me ask a few questions with that. Ms. Brady, you referred to the, the new report that you all are doing, the Children's Process. So you said it is a preliminary form. Is it in a draft form as well right now? Is it complete? Is that something that we could have? You are talking about the, the 10 projects? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. We are looking at these 10 projects uh, individually, the individual contracts that were signed by each one of the, for each one of these projects. And, and I would expect at the end of the contract period, because we want to see how this flows out over the next three years as the, as the contract gets put right. into place. But that, that report, is, is that, will that be a complete report that will be turned? Is it currently in a draft form? Is it just 10 isolated uh, right pieces? Right now we are gathering data. I don't know whether we will do a comprehensive report or whether we will do 10 individual reports or whether we will put it all together. But we are gathering data. Um, and the, the form that the final sort of summary or report, as we call it, will take, but we haven't decided how that's going to look. But okay. it will be some sort of summary data and evaluation of the worth of PLAs. That's what when that gets into a draft form that is available to be able to send to our committee, I would very much like to request a copy of that, and that would be sent over to us so we could add it so that that draft report could be added to this draft report that's already completed and get a chance to do a side-by-side -side on that. M Mr. Gordon, we are getting very close to your time. I understand that well. In the past, were you aware, and I know you are you, not familiar with the very earliest days, obviously, the Obama administration and all, some of the transition. I don't believe you were there right at the very beginning with the executive order. Do you know if that executive order was done and was implemented based on the fact that during previous administrations, PLAs were blocked and were not, not able to be used? Uh, Mr. Chairman, you are quite correct uh, in that I was not in the administration at the time. You probably know I was in the Office of General Counsel at the Government Accountability Office, GAO, uh, and joined the administration only in November of 2009. Right. So I am not in a position to, uh, to know what happened uh, well, originally. I am trying to process through because obviously we want to use the PLAs. And I, I want to uh, reiterate, uh, this conversation is not about excluding PLAs. It is just trying to determine why there is a uh, an encouragement to use them uh, other than just that is best competition, uh, to try to provide that neutral playing field to say, it, uh, my, my question is, has there been a tendency in the agencies that they didn't want to use PLAs, and so there needs to be an aggressive approach to say, no, we encourage you to use them? Now I understand the question, I, and I can speak to that, Mr. Chairman. Uh, under the prior administration, there was an executive order that prohibited agencies from saying, in this particular project, we, we need to have a PLA in place. That they were not allowed to do. What we wanted to do was say, agencies should be allowed to look project by project and say, here is a project where it would not serve efficiency to have a PLA, but here is a project where it would serve it. That is what we are trying to do. We want that to be, to be available, not to dictate it. And I should be, I should be careful in the words. We are not encouraging the use of PLAs. 
We are encouraging agencies to consider whether, in fact, they need to require PLAs in a particular project. But by increasing the point scale on them, as we talked about before, it gives them a, an immediate advantage <clears throat> to be able to engage and say, we, we may be a little higher in price, but we are greater in value because we, you know, there can't be a strike during this time. We are going to offset our collective bargaining uh, agreement with this, that we won't fulfill that to be able to get this project. Uh, so it, it does skewer somewhat, and it, it concerns me when this draft summary, one of the statements in it says that there is a risk that PLAs will exclude by having PLA in it that it excludes small and minority businesses. I understand. And I will be happy to let Ms. Britta speak about GSA, but as a government-wide matter, I will tell you that there are many factors. I have been dealing with, with solicitations and procurements for over 20 years now. There are many, many factors that get far more than 10 percent of the points on the technical side. Your past performance, your technical approach, your use of small businesses. Right? That is, uh, the, the, the amount that you commit to subcontract to small businesses is frequently a factor, and it can frequently have more than 10 percent of the points. So that in the mix of things, what you are what you're capturing, and, and there are different ways to do this. GSA has taken one approach, and we are evaluating how well that works. But you can, it seems to me you can appreciate that in a best value context, where you may get efficiencies through the, the use of a project labor agreement, you want to capture that just as you typically get more than 10 points for having a good track record, good past performance. And I absolutely understand that. And again, there may be great locations where a PLA is the perfect tool to be able to use in that toolbox on it. But the last thing we would want to do is to be able to try to put out the word and say this group gets a higher score based on the fact that they are unionized and discourage other people from engaging in the competitive environment. Uh, we want to be able to have a level playing field in, in a competitive environment so we are getting best value and as many contractors as possible are bidding for our projects to get the best possible price. If we are pushing in such a way to say there is a possibility someone will be excluded, that is what I am beginning to question and to say if this report is questioning that from GSA, then I am also saying, okay, what was the evidence to make this shift when a year after the shift was made, or two years after the shift was made, there was an immediate look to say, okay, maybe there is a problem here? If I could, Mr. Chairman, I would point out that when GAO, my former employer, looked at project labor agreements in, I think, 1998, they reported that there was a wide range of views. Some people said they were very helpful. Some people said they were more efficient. They saved costs. They cost costs. The beauty of what GSA has done is it has gotten us real examples, real examples, not theoretical, not hypothetical. Great. Thank you. I would like to yield uh, one moment for Mr. Murphy. Thank you. Just a, a, a follow-up question. The Chairman was uh, uh, talking about point scoring systems in which uh, a PLA bidder may get more points. Um, just to clarify, um, the individual decisions about uh, how bids are structured is up to individual agencies. Is that, uh, is that correct? Absolutely. And some agencies may choose uh, to uh, incorporate an increased uh, point system for uh, PLA uh, bids, um, but that is not required by this executive order, nor is it required by uh, any other direction from the administration. You are absolutely correct. What we are doing at this point is letting agencies take different approaches. We may down the road, as we listen to what the agencies are doing, we may come up with best practices. That is what we frequently do, whether we are dealing with the ways of handling organizational conflicts of interest, best value, past performance. We let agencies try different approaches with some guidance. And then, as we learn more, we can give more specific guidance. Thank you very much. Mr. Gordon, Ms. Britta, thank you so much for joining us here. And uh, you are excused, and you are going to make your flight on time. I am so very grateful, Mr. Hope, no, hopefully it is all running. I am grateful that you all are able to be here. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We will take a brief moment to be able to recess to reset for the next panel.
like to welcome our third panel. Uh, Mr. Maurice Baskin is a partner with the law firm of Venable LLP and represents the associ uh, Associated Builders and Contractors. Professor David Turek is the Executive Director of the Beacon Hill Institute at Suffolk University. Mr. Kirby Wu is the President of Wu and Associates. And Mr. Mike Kennedy is the General Counsel of Associated, uh, Associated General Contractors of America. Pursuant to committee rules, all witnesses are sworn in before they testify. If you would please ri rise and raise your right hands. Gentlemen, do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you are about to give this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Let the record reflect the witnesses answered in the affirmative. You may be seated. In order to allow time for discussion, I would like you to limit your testimony to five minutes. Obviously, we have mercy if you go a little bit over on that to allow for your uh, testimony, but we have received your written testimony already, and uh, that will be made part of the record. Uh, Mr. Baskin, I would like to be able to recognize you for five minutes. I'm sorry, Mr. Baskin, may I stop you? Is your microphone on? Can you tell if the light is on? How's that? That's Any perfect. Better? Thank you. Do I need to start over? I, I just said good morning. Uh, here representing Associated Builders and Contractors, which is the National Construction Industry Trade Association, representing 23,000 merit shop contractors employing an estimated 2 million workers. I have previously testified before on the subject of uh, government mandated PLAs before another subcommittee of this committee, and I have resubmitted that testimony for the record of this proceeding so that I can focus today on the very important bill introduced by Congressman Sullivan, H.R. 735. Uh, this bill is vitally needed to prevent the ongoing waste of taxpayer dollars and corruption of the Federal procurement system that is being caused by the President's Executive Order 13502 and the agency rules that have implemented it. The President's PLA executive order discriminates against the 87 percent of construction workers and their contractor employers who choose not to belong to or have contracts with labor unions. This order was issued as one of the President's first acts in February 2009 with no meaningful outreach to the construction community, no transparency in its formulation. We heard today that people representatives of the administration still don't know how it came to be, and no factual justification at all for its findings. Uh, most importantly, there were no significant labor problems on any Federal construction projects during the eight years governed by President Bush's Executive Order 13202, which prevented Federal agencies from requiring or prohibiting PLAs on Federal construction projects or on Federally assisted projects. Uh, in the absence of any problems, and from the manner in which the Obama order was put into effect, it is clear that the only reason for the PLA executive order now in place was and is politics. Having heard or read the testimony of representatives from the Office of Management and Budget and the GSA at now two congressional hearings, uh, we have yet to hear them identify any factual basis in the form of market research or identified labor problems previously existing on Federal construction projects that justifies the Federal Government's new restriction on competition through PLA mandates. Uh, we, we heard today that it is a process and that it is open to competition, but as the members rightly pointed out, there is a preference. The, the thumb is on the scale. It is now being tilted, if not mandated, uh, in favor of these PLAs, and it is impacting competition. They are doing a pilot program, a pilot program that is ongoing in nature, apparently. It is continuing to this day on every GSA project. That is a peculiar definition of the word pilot, while they are supposedly gathering market research data, uh, which is contrary to the way that all other procurements have been done in the past. GSA has adopted, apparently, a, a build first and ask questions later policy, which is contrary to settled procurement principles. At the same time, many academic studies, and we are going to hear more about that later, uh, and research by the government's own consultants, as has already pointed out, have established that government-mandated PLAs increase the cost to taxpayers, reduce the number of potential bidders, and particularly the number of subcontractors to those bidders who are merit shop. They do nothing to improve the quality, safety, timeliness or overall efficiency of government construction projects. Only Congress can effectively stop the political favoritism in contract awards that is wasting taxpayer dollars and corrupting the Federal procurement process. And that is what H.R. 735, the Government Neutrality in Contracting Act, will do. 
Uh, H.R. 735 will simply reinforce the existing Federal mandate in favor of full and open competition in all Federal procurements, with specific reference to PLAs. The bill will prohibit Federal agencies once and for all from awarding construction projects based on the improper consideration of whether the contractors are willing to enter into labor agreements. Until this executive order, that had not been the rule of law in this country under Federal procurement principles. As the bill states, agencies shall neither require nor prohibit contractors from adopting PLAs as a condition of being awarded the work, nor discriminate on that basis. The bill is neutral. can't emphasize that enough. It is neutral on the subject of PLAs. It simply keeps the government out of the process. It closely tracks the Bush executive orders that were upheld by the Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit in the Albaugh case. So there is clearly no basis for a legal challenge to H.R. 735, and it avoids interfering with uh, Federal labor laws because it specifically says that nothing will be construed to prohibit a contractor or a subcontractor from voluntarily entering into uh, a PLA on their own. If they are so great, let the market show it, let them come forward and prove it without it being tilted or mandated by the Federal Government. We applaud your efforts to uh, promote H.R. 735, and I will be happy to answer questions after the other speakers. Thank you, Mr. Baskin. Mr. Turek. I am David Turek. I am a professor and chairman of economics and executive director of the Beacon Hill Institute at Suffolk University in Boston, which is a Ph.D. granting um, institution. I would like to thank Chairman Langford and members of the subcommittee for inviting me, and I appreciate the opportunity to submit testimony on H.R. 735. My comments are my own and do not represent the opinions of Suffolk University, nor do they represent my support for any organization or private interest that might stand to benefit from the passage of H.R. 735, uh, which I heartily endorse. I would like to enter into the record studies of project labor agreements that the Beacon Hill Institute has performed under my direction over the last eight years. Of course, we have already heard about those. Among these are studies in which BHI estimated the effects of PLAs on construction costs for school building projects in Massachusetts, Connecticut, and New York. We found that PLAs added 12 to 18 percent to final construction costs in Massachusetts and Connecticut and 20 percent to final bids for school construction projects in New York. I suppose we will get into the uh, comments from uh, Dr. Steele in the question and answer, but uh, since he preempted me, I am going to make a point about uh, what he had to say. Uh, he accuses us of spurious correlation. Well, I have a buzzword that I can use about his work, which is multicollinearity. Th these are the kinds of uh, buzzwords that economists typically use when they are criticizing each other's work in an academic setting. And I am sorry uh, that he has decided to conduct this conversation in a way that reflects more his outlandish and bizarre characterizations of our work than what we actually did. But we can get back to that later. In another study, we examined the Federal Government's experience with the Bush-era ban on government-mandated PLAs. This study was aimed at determining how the record of construction projects conducted over this period reflects on President Obama's executive order encouraging PLAs on construction projects costing $25 million or more. President Obama claimed that the order was needed because, quote, large-scale construction projects pose special challenges to efficient and timely procurement by the Federal Government. Our study proceeded on the premise that if President Obama is correct about the need to mandate PLAs in order to overcome these, quote, special challenges, unquote, then President Bush's ban on mandatory PLAs should have produced many instances of the delays, strikes, cost overruns, et cetera, against which PLA advocates frequently warn. We asked the associated builders and contractors to assist us in getting the needed data from the Federal Government. Using the Freedom of Information Act, ABC wrote to Federal agencies for procurement responsibilities, including OMB and, U and GSA, for information relating to any problems caused by the absence of government-mandated PLAs over the period of the Bush executive order. The result? No respondent to the ABC letters, including the OMB and the GSA, could substantiate the occurrence of any delays or cost overruns on Bush-era projects costing $25 million or more that were attributable to the absence of a PLA. This finding should come as no surprise. The real purpose of a PLA is not to deal with special challenges, but to discourage bids from non-union contractors and to give the PLA unions control over the hiring process. 
PLAs accomplish this purpose by requiring contractors to follow onerous work rules to turn away from their own labor force in favor of labor provided by a union hiring hall and to pay fringe benefits a second time that they already provide their workers. Consider in this light the fatuous nature of the argument for PLAs. The argument presupposes that the work will be performed by the very unions that create the conditions under which the predicted delays, jurisdictional disputes, and work stoppages could occur if a PLA is not adopted. The unions that create these conditions are predestined to get the work, however, only if the PLA is adopted and then has the intended effect of discouraging non-union contractors from bidding. I have read a number of studies, mostly, most commissioned by state and local government agencies, which purport to show that a PLA would save on costs. Typically, however, these studies adopt the same tortuous logic that the unions employ in support of a PLA. The studies show cost savings by assuming away the possibility that a decision not to adopt a PLA might produce lower bids from qualified contractors than a decision to adopt one would produce. However, the best way to avoid cost overruns and delays is to encourage not to, not to discourage bids from contractors who are not burdened by the collective bargaining agreements that hobble the competitiveness of the PLA union workers and their contractors. According to government data, the fraction of all construction workers who belong to unions fell by 25 percent, from 17.5 percent in 2000 to 13.1 percent in 2010. So what we have is a state of affairs in which 13 percent of construction workers are attempting to protect their jobs against the other 87 percent and in an added cost to taxpayers. These facts show that the real agenda behind government mandated PLAs is to shore up the market share of a dwindling minority of construction workers at the expense of the vast majority and the taxpayer. By passing H.R. 735, Congress could take an important step toward rejecting the fatuous reasoning that lies behind PLA mandates and ending what amounts to a discriminatory and costly handout to a group of special pleaders. I conclude by pointing out that H.R. 735 is not anti-labor, and in fact, it's not even anti-union. I'm currently involved in a case where a, uh, a contractor is suing because its union was excluded from a New York City PLA. PLAs are only about the, the unions that manage to have the political clout to induce government agencies to require them to um, form a PLA. Nor does this legislation uh, to strip government of a useful tool for achieving economy in state government. If the tool is a useful one, then contractors are free on their own uh, behalf to adopt the PLA, nothing standing in the way for that. Therefore, I believe that the H.R. 735 is clearly in the public interest, and again, I strongly support its adoption. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stark. Mr. Blue. Good morning, Chairman Lankford, Ranking Member Conley, and members of the subcommittee. My name is Kirby Wu. I'm the president of Wu & Associates, located in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. On behalf of the associated builders and contractors and the Marist Shop contracting community, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today in support of the Government Neutrality and Contracting Act, H.R. 735. I hope my testimony sheds some light on how government-mandated project labor agreements harm qualified contractors and employees that would want nothing more than to compete on a level playing field to build on time and on budget construction projects at the best possible price. PLA mandates and preferences by Federal agencies result in increased costs for contractors and unnecessary procurement delays inject uncertainty and favoritism in the Federal procurement process and stands as a barrier to growth for businesses and job creation in an industry that is already suffering an unemployment rate of 17.8 percent. This is why the industry supports legislative remedies like H.R. 735, which restores fairness in Federal contracting and will eliminate waste so the government can build more projects and create more construction jobs. Wound Associates is a small business success story. We have grown into an industry-leading, award-winning general contractor specializing in design-build projects lead sustainable design and historic preservation for Federal, State, local and private clients. Our firm's success depends on the principles of free enterprise and attracting the most qualified, talented personnel and companies for a job, regardless of their labor affiliation. Over the years, we have successfully performed millions of dollars worth of Federal, State, local and private construction projects without the need to enter into a PLA. 
The contracting policies of the Federal Government influence the growth and success of small business like Wu & Associates, as well as the economic well-being of our employees and their families. PLA mandates place mayor shop competitors at a disadvantage and promotes discrimination based on labor affiliation. PLAs have a practical effect of creating jobs exclusively for unionized construction tradespeople by forcing union representation or compulsory union membership, inefficient and archaic union work rules, payment of union dues, forced contributions to union pension and benefit plans, and a host of other problems on employees of merit shop contractors, like my firm's employees that have freely decided not to join a union. Injecting PLA mandates into the Federal procurement process discourages competitions from qualified contractors like my own who employ 87 percent of the U.S. construction workforce. It doesn't take an economic degree to know that less competition from a pool of qualified bidders leads to increased costs for the government and taxpayers. If members of this subcommittee think PLA mandates somehow advance economy and efficiency in government contracting, Please take a look at my written testimony, which describes in great, great detail my unfortunate experience with a Federal PLA mandate that resulted in procurement delays, red tape, and needless litigation costs. In short, in 2010, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers mandated a PLA on a project in Camden, New Jersey, in the middle of the bidding process. By doing so, the Corps sent a message to qualified businesses like mine that we were not welcome to build this project unless we agreed to use union labor and follow the terms and conditions of a PLA. This is ironic because we were previously selected as a pre-qualified contractor to bid this project. After weeks of uncertainty and attempts to get the corpse to reverse the PLA, we were left with no choice but to file a bid protest with the Government Accountability Office against the corpse's illegal and discriminatory mandate. Eventually, in the face of a bid protest, the Corp abandoned their PLA mandate, but they replaced it with an illegal and discriminatory PLA preference that enticed contractors to voluntarily submit a PLA offer by giving them additional credit in their technical evaluation of our F offer as part of the best value procurement process. We decided not to pursue this contract further because we felt it was not worth investing the additional company resources to prepare a bid and compete against contractors submitting PLA offers in this distorted playing field. This exercise resulted in lost time and money for our small business that we could have invested it back into our workforce and company. It also resulted in needless procurement delays exceeding two months as the Corp's bid submission deadline was extended a number of times to accommodate the PLA controversy. Remarkably, the contract was eventually awarded to a Marishop general contractor at a bid price nearly 15 percent below the original $16.5 million estimate without a PLA offer. And today, the project is reportedly on time and on budget. The winning contractor would have been discouraged or eliminated from competing if not for our efforts to fight the PLA mandate. As a taxpayer, it is outrageous that the government are wasting tax dollars and denying opportunity to quality businesses and their skilled workforces to cater to just 13.1 percent of the U.S. construction workforce. I ask that the members of the subcommittee support Mr. Sullivan's Government Neutrality in Contracting Act. Contractors and not Federal procurement officials pressured by special interests should be the ones deciding whether a PLA is an appropriate tool. Wu and Associates applause the Oversight and Government Reform Committee for its continued interest in the issue of government mandated PLAs. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf of small businesses and mayor shop contracting community. We deserve a fair opportunity to provide the best construction product at the best possible price to taxpayers. Thank you, Mr. Boy. Mr. Kennedy, we will receive your testimony for five minutes. Good morning, Chairman Langford uh, and members of the subcommittee. My name is Michael Kennedy. I, am, uh, I have the privilege of serving as the General Counsel of the Associated General Contractors of America. I am here today to express the Association's strong support for H.R. 735 and the neutrality that this bill seeks to achieve. AGC is the leading trade association in the construction industry. It has more than 33,000 members in nearly 100 chapters throughout the United States. Among these members are building, highway, industrial, and utility contractors. While some of them are quite large, most are small and closely held. 
Many are federal contractors. AGC was founded in 1918, and historically, a majority of its members have been union contractors. Today, such contractors are in the minority, but they remain a large and very important segment of the Association's membership. To this hearing on project labor agreements and H.R. 735, AGC therefore brings a broad perspective. Before turning to the central subjects of today's hearing, I should explain that the labor unions in the construction industry are unique. Unlike their industrial counterparts, these unions have organized themselves along craft lines. One union represents carpenters, another represents operating engineers, another represents electricians, and so on down the line. Industrial unions represent everyone in the appropriate bargaining unit without regard to any differences in their job classifications. But construction unions are different. No one of them represents all of the craft workers on a typical construction project. The individual agreements negotiated with each of these unions are similarly limited. Each agreement covers a separate and single craft. But, on the other hand, the typical agreement applies to all of the work that the craft performs in a particular area. PLAs differ from these area-wide agreements in two ways. PLAs are typically negotiated with several unions and therefore cover several crafts. And as the name suggests, PLAs are limited to individual projects and are not area-wide. The historical purpose of PLAs, dating back to a time when unions represented nearly 90 percent of all construction workers, was to eliminate inconsistencies in these area-wide agreements that would otherwise apply to particular projects, such as differences in work rules and expiration dates. Then and now, PLAs typically supersede such area-wide agreements. Over the last 60 years, as the percentage of construction workers that unions represent has fallen below 14 percent, project labor agreements have become less and less relevant. A large majority of today's work is not subject to any agreement with any labor union, and the need to address differences between and among labor agreements has greatly diminished. Open shop contractors are free to coordinate their employment practices entirely on their own initiative and without changing or superseding any prior agreements with labor unions. In this new environment, union contractors are more likely to seek PLAs for the purpose of meeting their open shop competition. Without seeking to open or reopen their area-wide agreements, such contractors can seek the more favorable terms or conditions they may need to compete for individual projects. AGC neither supports nor opposes PLAs per se. The Association takes the position that such agreements are just another of the many tools that contractors, not owners, but contractors, should have at their disposal as they seek to meet their clients' needs. At the same time, AGC strongly opposes government mandates for PLAs, or area-wide agreements, or any other labor agreements for publicly funded construction projects. The National Labor Relations Act commits such matters to the discretion of construction employers and their employees. And for a host of reasons, AGC believes that government contracting agencies should follow suit. As we have already heard, government mandates for PLAs discourage competition. They typically require open shop contractors to make fundamental changes in the way they would approach an upcoming project and to incur costs that such contractors would not otherwise incur. Such mandates may also trouble union contractors. They may also require union contractors to make significant changes in the way they would approach a project. Indeed, their typical purpose and effect is to, deprive, is to deprive union contractors of the opportunity to work under the area-wide agreements that these contractors have already negotiated. Government mandates can also disrupt the bargaining over area-wide agreements. They invite the construction unions to bypass the contractors for whom their members work and seek to negotiate with what may be inexperienced public officials. 
They also give unions the leverage to make demands that the unions could not otherwise make. Beyond that, it remains clear that construction contractors are in the best position to determine whether, and if so when, a PLA will help them meet the government's legitimate interest in having its projects constructed on time, within budget, and to all specifications. Federal construction contractors have to post performance bonds and to provide a host of contractual guarantees that they will meet their obligations. It follows that these contractors already have ample incentive to consider any PLA or other labor agreement that would make it easier or less expensive for them to perform their work. In sum, AGC supports H.R. 735. AGC would suggest that the committee make a technical amendment to Section 3D, where the bill authorizes an exemption from its substantive provisions under special circumstances. As currently written, this provision actually tilts the scale against union contractors. But AGC believes that the problem is inadvertent and can be quite easily corrected. Thank you again. Let me simply repeat that AGC opposes Federal mandates for project labor agreements and supports H.R. 735. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to thank all the witnesses for being here. Mr. Wu, it's, uh, it's good to see somebody who spent a little bit of time in Pittsburgh in the room beside yeah. myself. So I, I saw your time at, at Carnegie Mellon and Professor Turek. I, I think your, your, your background kind of speaks for itself. I don't know that anybody could question what you have done. So thank I am you, going Congressman. To I wonder if I could make a correction, though. I inadvertently sure. said Dr. Steele and I meant Dr. Phillips. I have no idea why I said that, but I okay. like to get the name right. Okay. That is fine. We will note that. I am going to recognize myself for five minutes. And I think this is critical because this hearing today is not about unions or non-unions. It is not about who gets the bid or who doesn't get the bid. It is about fairness. And certainly, if the President's executive order is based on something that he thought was unfair, anybody in the panel, is there any instance anywhere that would have caused the President to issue this executive order? I can't find anything in any of the testimony on any of the witnesses that would suggest that there was a problem that existed in the bidding process. And having done many RFPs myself and looking at it, I tend to feel the other way. It is, it is extremely exclusionary, and it does tilt the playing field. So if anybody, and Mr. Baskin, Professor Turek, Mr. Wu, Mr. Kennedy, if anybody could offer anything that would perhaps shed some light on why this is, in fact, issued and why does it have any, any importance to what it is that we are trying to do, if it is about fairness. Well, I can respond, if I can respond first, I think. Certainly. Mr. may also speak to it, but as indicated, as we heard from the witnesses earlier, they have no specific labor problems on previous contracts uh, uh, procured under the Bush order. There was no problem. I think it has been referred to as a solution in search of a problem. Uh, the only justification for it has to be political because of the way it was implemented with no outreach and with no identified uh, real-world circumstances in which problems had arisen without PLAs being mandated by the government. It is just totally unnecessary. And contrary to decades of law, as well as the Competition and Contracting Act, that requires full and open competition on Federal projects. Professor. We did all we could to find out if there were any uh, uh, contracts under the Bush administration that uh, suffered for lack of a PLA and simply couldn't come up with one. It was not only the FOIA letters that ABC sent out, we combed through government databases, uh, looked over survey results uh, from a national survey, everything we could to find out if there were any, and there simply were not. Uh, and I do remember a campaign speech that President Obama made in which he promised project labor agreements. So again, I think that is probably the best explanation for the executive order. Well, Wu and Associates, frankly, uh, we would not bid a project that would have a project labor agreement on it. Um, the previous testimony where the GSA procurement officer stated that there was a 10-point uh, system built into their RFP process uh, would certainly raise our eyebrows in our office uh, as we look for fair bidding opportunities in the Federal, public, and State sectors. Uh, that would be something that would jump out right away and uh, it would probably be a project that we would not pursue. Because I would agree with you, Mr. Kelly, that on the private sector side, every dollar matters. Uh, to, put a, to put together a bid in the millions of dollars takes a tremendous amount of time and resources for our company. And if there is the slightest disadvantage going in, uh, it would strongly discourage us from bidding the project. Mr. Kennedy. 
I am not aware of any, uh, uh, any systemic problems uh, that the Federal Government suffered during the Bush administration as a result of its executive order. Uh, that executive order uh, made it abundantly clear that uh, construction contractors were free to pursue project labor agreements where the contractors, uh, knowing the work that they had to do, knowing the commitments that they had to make, uh, believed that a PLA would be in their interest. Um, and with that said, I, I believe we had an era of very open competition uh, that was healthy for all sides of the industry. Okay. Mr. Moo, just following up on this, because I have done the same thing you have, and when you get these RFPs, you can be excluded from, your, your bid can be thrown out if you don't dot all the I's and cross all the T's. And what's always bothered me since getting here five months ago is we have a continual parade of people who have actually never done what it is that they are regulating, and people who have never actually had to have their own skin in the game determining how these bids are, are, are going to be structured and how they are going to be awarded. And I find that completely troublesome, just so the general public knows, because not all of us have the opportunity to do this. When you do submit a bid, 10 points, critical, not critical? It is absolutely critical. You know, when we are investing thousands and thousands of dollars of our own overhead, project managers, estimators, support staff, uh, to put a bid together, a, a, a multimillion dollar bid could take three to four weeks for our office to uh, put together, working along with our subcontractors as well. Uh, we can't afford to go invest that time and money into an RFP process where we feel like there is any chance that we will be at a disadvantage, because there are other opportunities out there where the disadvantage is not present. I could go bid another project. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the, the addition of this language does not encourage a wider universe of bidders. It actually does limit those who would take the time. I have friends that it cost them $50,000 to prepare a bid, and this is in private industry. I can't imagine what the hoops they have to jump through here to get a bid ready, and knowing that at the end of the day, if they don't include the PLA language, they are at a 10-point disadvantage right off the bat. So I thank you. Thank you for allowing me to slip out. I would like to be able to recognize Mr. Murphy for five minutes of questions. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would like to submit a letter to the record um, from uh, the uh, president of Toyota. Uh, and uh, in it, uh, he says this, Toyota has used and required project labor agreements uh, on many of their biggest and most important projects. He says that Toyota has consistently employed project labor agreements for our major construction projects, and we could not have been more pleased with the results. To date, approximately 45 million man hours have been vested in the construction of nine automobile truck and component plants in the United States. In each and every instance, these projects were completed on time and on budget and with an exemplary safety record. Toyota, as well as major American and international companies like Boeing and Walmart have made the decision to require project labor agreements because they think it is the best business practice for them. Um, and so let me ask this question to each of the panel members, and I just need a yes or no answer. I have only got five minutes here. Do you think that we should pass legislation as a Congress that would prohibit the requirement of PLAs uh, in private sector construction work? And I just need a yes or no uh, answer to that prohibit question. Prohibit the requirement of that would pro that would pro no, that would nobody, prohibit. Nobody's that asking for that. On, well, I'm not. Uh, I'm asking. Would you? Would no. you? You wouldn't support that. Would you support that legislation? Certainly not. No, I would not. Well, a private owner is backing a decision to require a PLA with its own resources and has the flexibility to use delivery systems that are not available in the public sector. I see no reason why the government should step in and, and interfere with that. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. So I hear a lot of talk from my Republican friends and from my conservative friends about how uh, the government should run more like a business. But what you are proposing to do here, even in an act that has some nice words about neutrality, is to take away from the Federal Government, a tool that a lot of private companies use, which is a decision that they make that a requirement that PLAs uh, be uh, used in construction projects is good for their particular project. What we are asking here today is for that tool to be taken away from the Federal Government. Uh, and as we have heard over and over and over again, there is nothing mandating that this be used. 
project by project. All the Federal order does is just encourage a look at whether a PLA would be worthwhile, as many private companies have. And so I am searching here for why we have a double standard. I think we are all searching for why we have a panel with only witnesses that are critical of PLAs. And so uh, I look to the underlying political motives here. Uh, Mr. Turk, you said in your testimony that you are not here out of an anti-union bias, that this isn't about unions, this is about the best use of taxpayer dollars. Um, but, Mr. Turk, just uh, about two months ago, you wrote a piece entitled, Let's Put an End to All Collective Bargaining. And in it you wrote, referring to what was going on in Wisconsin, the Wisconsin episode is therefore just the leading edge of a political moment, movement that could, if conducted skillfully, make it possible to unravel pu public support for the unions in so dramatic a fashion as to change the face of American politics. This would indeed be a wonderful thing to behold. So let me ask you this. Do you stand by this blog post, this article that you wrote, in which you call for an end to all collective bargaining? Oh, I most certainly do. Uh, but I want to make a distinction here. I am here limiting my remarks to this particular piece of legislation. And I, uh, the committee is, of course, free to um, evaluate my remarks here on the basis of things that I have said elsewhere, like this, for example. But uh, what I am presenting here are opinions based on research, not just my broader opinions about how collective bargaining fits into 21st century America. So, yes, I think that, I think that we are finding out in state after state uh, the harm that collective bargaining has done when it is allowed between uh, government workers and their governments. Even Massachusetts has faced up to the reality and, and done something about the excesses of the union power within the, um, within the, uh, the go among government workers. And yes, I think that collective bargaining is a, is a uh, tool whose time has passed. Thank you. And so uh, I am asking that question because your work hasn't just been criticized by the one uh, author that we cited here. It has been criticized over and over. And so I am trying to figure out uh, why not only we have a panel that seems to be rigged uh, in favor of the legislation that we are debating, but also uh, why we seem to have uh, uh, studies put before us that uh, aren't based uh, in good uh, empirical and statistical uh, requirements. And I, I look at your public record, I look at the agenda that you clearly have to end collective bargaining writ large in this country, uh, and I put it together uh, with what seems uh, to be a systemic approach on behalf of the Republican majority and on behalf of opponents of organized labor across this country, whether it be in this committee or in State legislatures across the country, to take away from individuals the ability to collectively bargain and to take away from government the very tool that private companies use uh, on a regular basis, which is if they believe it is in the best interest of that particular bid to require a project labor agreement. That is all the executive order does. And because this seems to be a hearing that has much to do about nothing, uh, I, I bring to the table a political agenda which seems hidden but incredibly relevant. And with that, I will yield back the balance of my time. Uh, may I respond? Uh, hold on just a moment. Uh, I do want to accept without objection the Toyota letter into the record that you had mentioned earlier that you requested to have into the record. Mr. Turk, it is actually my moment uh, for questioning at this time, and so, yes, you would be uh, free to be able to respond to that. First of all, the um, quality of our statistical work has nothing to do with anybody's opinions about uh, collective bargaining or political issues. I am not responsible for the invitations that went out for this meeting. Uh, had I had anything to say about it, I would have wanted Dr. Phillips here so that I could have rebutted his attack on our works, as bizarre as it is. And fi finally, uh, the, the uh, work that we have done has, in fact, appeared in a peer-reviewed journal. It's, it, well, the, our study of Massachusetts was published by an online journal out of Bentley University. And so the idea that the, these numbers that we are coming up with are just made up out of thin air is, is, is itself completely wrong. We have a lot at stake. We are a Ph.D. granting Department of Economics that, that survives and prospers only by virtue of the integrity of our work. Our work has been out there for years, and if anybody wants to find problems with it, they are free to. Uh, Dr. Phillips has tried. His attacks, I think, are wrong. But again, those are the kinds of things that we could argue in another forum. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chairman, may I respond to the con Congressman's question that was unanswered about why all yes, the you may. panel said that we don't need legislation uh, to prohibit 
private sector PLAs, and that's because the National Labor Relations Act already has protections about them to say that they must be voluntarily entered into, not coerced, and entered into only by employers in the construction industry. And what we have going on here under the Obama order is a mandate. It is coercion of uh, contractors, the private employers, on Federal agency projects in which the executive order encourages those agencies to, in fact, mandate or discriminate in favor of them. And that is what the current laws prohibit. So that is why we don't need a change in those laws. Mr. How, Chair, Mr. Chairman, the, the gentleman is responding directly to me. Would you yield one? I would. I yield one minute. I, 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 you have used a lot of words here. You used corruption several times in your testimony. You have now used coercion. Um, I, I, I think. I think we need to tone down the level of rhetoric here when we are talking about an executive order that simply asks individual agencies to consider PLAs when appropriate. Uh, I think by any reading of that, it is, A, hard to uh, suggest that there is anything that is coercive about that executive order, and certainly in your testimony in which you suggested that it corrupted the process. Uh, I think those are strong words with legal ramifications that you should be very careful about using before the United States Congress. And if I may respond, yes, you may. they are merited, uh, because we have been seeing the uh, Federal procurement process divorced from the rule of law. For decades it was established that labor uh, backing, labor affiliation was irrelevant to responsibility of contractors. And by attaching that to this process, it is uh, rank favoritism, it is not permissible under the law, and until it stops, we have to say what it is, if anything is to be done about it. Mr. Baskin, are you seeking a, uh, an advantage in the contracting process by saying that uh, PLAs are not or a neutral ground? Is that some advantage that you are seeking? No. Neutrality is the word. Okay. So at, at this point, based on your testimony before, it is not an issue if you are bidding against someone that has a, a PLA or a non-PLA, union shop, non-union shop, that is irrelevant to you as long as it is a level playing field when you go in to actually do the bidding. Is yes. ABC has members who have signed union contracts. So does AGC. Uh, and many more uh, who have not, because 87 percent of the market is, uh, of the industry is non-union. But the merit shop philosophy is work should be awarded and performed regardless of labor affiliation. That should have nothing to do with it. May the best, most responsible contractor win, do the best work for the best price. That is all we are looking for, and that is all the Federal taxpayers should be looking for. Thank you. Mr. Wu, you mentioned before that you have actually backed out of a contract during the bidding process when you saw the direction it was going, that it was going to really take a PLA you know, contractor to be able to do that. Uh, that is obviously anecdotal evidence for you personally. Are there other contractors that you have related with to say, I just don't bid on Federal contracts when they are over $25 million, and I know those are the specifications? I am sorry, could you repeat that? Uh, do, do you see, have you spoken to other contractors as well on these contracts that are out there for bid, over $25 million that have the PLA uh, encouragement in them that are also saying, besides yourself, I am just not going to do that bid, it is not worth the trouble? Yes, I, I encounter contractors all the time on a general contracting level and a subcontracting level that simply will not bid projects uh, if a project labor agreement is part of the RFP process. So it, it is your belief that it is reducing the amount of competition in the field? I am very convinced of that. I have seen it uh, in the bidding process. Uh, I have seen the amount of bidders that have turned out. Uh, I have talked to my own subcontractors uh, as to whether or not they are pursuing PLA projects. and. Uh, Many, if not all of them, have been discouraged. Okay, thank you. I'd like to uh, honor Mr. Cummings with five minutes of questions. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Baskin. I want to follow up on some questions. I just want to make a statement with regard to something my colleague, Mr. Murphy, said. You know, as a uh, as a fellow, a lawyer, and one who has represented many people who have been accused wrongfully. Uh, and one, all of us, I think, have been trained with regard to, you know, certain words uh, and the use of them and their legal ramifications. And I was kind of surprised that you, of all these witnesses, you're the only one to talk about corruption. Um, I think we have to be kind of careful with those words. I really do. Um, and I don't say that. You know, I just, it just kind of surprised me. Um, and I don't know, you know, the full basis of it. I heard your explanation to Mr. Murphy, but I got to tell you, 
that um, coming from, you were from Venable? Did you say Venable? Is that your firm? Uh, I, I, just, I just think that we need to be careful with those words. Last year, the Ninth Circuit rejected claims that a PLA entered into by L.A. and Orange counties violated the due process rights of non-union contractors. Furthermore, earlier this year, the United States Supreme Court denied certiorari of a case challenging the seminal Boston Harbor case, where the court upheld the use of PLAs on public projects. And, Mr. Turk, um, I found it very interesting that you helped me make my point. Um, you said that you did not like the way Dr. Phillips addressed the issues, and basically, you, basically not putting words in your mouth, but this is the impression I got, uh, you, it sounds like you were almost wishing he was here so that you could, you know, look in his face and say you are inaccurate. I am sure you would have preferred that, would you have not? Yes. Uh, yeah. In other words, I don't want to don't embarrass my host, but yes, uh, if I am going to be accused of right. economic malpractice by right. another academic, I would like to have him in the room. Certainly, so and we would have too. So. And that is why I said you made my very point. That is why we, you heard the discussion earlier about how we were concerned on this side that we were not able to call him, and he was anxious to see you. He was anxious to look you in the face and say what he had to say, but we were denied that right. I also understand that the majority entered into the record instances in which the administration testified without other witnesses. And that is uh, not surprising. In this subcommittee, most recent hearing, it, Administrator Sustein testified by himself, and the minority did not protest because he was not deemed the minority witness by dictate of the majority. What is unprecedented is that the minority except the administration witness as their own when the majority has invited them and invited other private sector witnesses. I would like to make that very, very clear. And if there are instances where it has happened in this way, uh, the way this happened today, uh, that is the denial of a witness, uh, in this, under these circumstances, I would like to, I hope the Chairman, I know you said you are going to be looking into it. And I look forward to uh, hearing that from you. And I want to make it clear the reason why we are spending so much time on this is because um, all of you, I think, want sun sunshine. You want you talk about a fair process. That's all you all, that's all you all been talking about. Fair process. Somebody, I think it was you, Mr. Baskin, that's talked about level playing field. Well, guess what? We want a level playing field too. And so, um, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I, I just, um, we had uh, a, just extensive testimony, Mr. Turk, uh, and one of the things, from, from Dr. Phillips, that is, and I hope that one day, since we have now had two hearings on this issue, and at the rate we are going, I am sure we will have more, so perhaps the next time uh, we will have a chance to bring you back, Mr. Kirk Turk. I think Mr. Baskin said, you have done two. Well, you're on a roll, um, and so we will. And I, I don't think. Well, I just want to say one other thing to you, Mr. Turk. In the, you know, I think it, somebody over on the other side said something. They were picking and choosing from the uh, report of the GSA, and one of the things that did they did say they and they were talking about costs. They said, however, these studies talking about Sunshine Study did not address the cost impact of scope, timing, market, schedule, or quality variables. These variables uh, would contribute to increased costs, thereby reducing the level of cost increases that Beacon Hill argue are all strictly attributed to PLAs. And that is on page 4 of the report. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I would yield back. Mr. Chairman, if I may respond to the comment that was directed at me about the use of the word corruption. Yes, sir. Because I do want to clarify, I am not accusing the President of committing a crime. What I referred to in my statement, I just went back and checked, it is corruption of the system in the manner of a data corrupting a computer system. It's a, it refers to be messing up of the system. And I certainly stand behind that. And it does involve the element of coercion, which I referred to earlier, when an agency mandates that contractors accept these things as a condition of performing the work. So I appreciate the opportunity to clarify that. Mr. Chairman, just, just 10 seconds. Yes, sir. 
I want to thank you for clarifying that, for clarifying that because it's very, very important. I, I say it all the time in this committee. I hate for people to come in here, say things, and then it's like left on a wall and not to be erased ever. You know what? The press picks that up. And next thing you know, your wife is reading a story that you, know, you didn't even mean, saying that my husband accused the President of the United States of being corrupt. I know that's not what you said. I'm just saying. That's why I want to clear these things up, okay? Appreciate the opportunity. All right. Thank you. And thank you to all of you for coming. And uh, very grateful for your time and your very busy schedules and for you being able to be here as part of this conversation. So with that, this committee stands adjourned.